Well, um, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. And, uh, thank, and thank you very much for coming. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our UKIP uh, conference in Torquay uh, in the Southwest. And for those of you who had to travel, thank you for traveling. But hopefully nobody is uh, staying in a hotel that is still haunted by the spirit of uh, Basil Fulty. <laughs> now, our UKIP conference is not an advice bureau, but I'd like to start by talking about divorce. Divorce can be painful, and the most painful part is to get to the, to, to the final, to uh, make it final, to get to the decree absolute. There is claim and counterclaim, blame and counterblame. Indeed, divorce can often get nasty, although that should not be necessary. And the worst uh, part of it is who gets to keep what, who pays, and how much. Now, after the referendum, which was UKIP's referendum, our referendum, we are getting divorced from what was a marriage with the European Union. And it's worth pointing out, just quickly, that what we entered into 43 years ago with six other European countries with similar economies was to be part of a common market. It was not a marriage with 27 countries, many with different economies and at a completely different stages of development. But now the EU want our money. They want 100 billion. Now, of course, we all know that that figure has been plucked out from thin air. And the excuse is given that 100 billion euros was in the EU budget. Now, let's be very clear. And I can say this as a chartered accountant. A budget is just that, a budget. It is a projection. It's a forecast. It's not a reality. Assumptions can and do change, as they have in this case. The fact is, we, we owe the EU nothing. <laughs> and if we do choose to give them anything, that will be our choice and that will be our generosity and should be seen as such. But I would say to the British government, please remember, as Lennon and McCartney once sang, can't buy me love. Money can't buy me love. <laughs> and to continue the divorce analogy, we are yet to get divorced, but some people are already taking sides. And unfortunately, many people who ought to be are on, on our side are in fact on the other side. It's sad for us, but sad for them, but sadder still for them. Let me give you some of their names. Kenneth Clark. <laughs> Anna Subri. <laughs> I think I mispronounced her name, actually. Peter Mandelson. <laughs> Nick Clegg. <laughs> Tony Blair. <laughs> who apparently is going to return to British politics. <laughs> These are the usual suspects. But why is it that these very qualified people don't seem to understand that in any negotiation, and above all in this one, if you are not prepared to walk away, you give the other side all the cards? And indeed, with the EU, there was a recent example of that with the EU and Greece, and their negotiation with the Greek government. We've seen that already. Now, these, what makes it worse, that these are the same people who told us, instructed us, endlessly, at the time of the referendum, that you must accept the outcome of the referendum. But that was when they thought they would win. What they're now doing is carefully 
blatantly, and in my view, disgracefully, trying to overturn the results. Yeah. They ought to know better. Now, to Labour and Brexit. Now, we know that in the UK, Labour stands for unvarnished socialism. And not just any socialism, but Venezuelan-style socialism at that. <laughs> However, on Brexit, nobody really knows what Labour stands for. The Labour conference lasted four days. And in those four days, Labour couldn't find the time to debate Brexit at all. But what is clear is that a majority of Labour MPs who people have, have voted for want the UK in the single market. Now that has consequences. It means freedom of movement, an endless and enduring stream of payments to the EU, and that we continue to pay homage to the European Court of Justice. These are facts. But there's, a, but, but there's another fact which is even more important. Only around 12% of the UK's economy is accounted for by exports to the 27 member states. Nevertheless, so long as we remain in the so-called single market, so long will 100% of our economy be subject to all the rules, laws, regulations, and directives of the European Union. And out of the EU, we would have no say, no say at all, not even the totally inadequate say that we have at the, ha, have at the moment. This would not be a good outcome for our country, and that is something you will never hear on the BBC. <laughs> now, on trade, let me draw your attention to one fact. Um, I'm not a magician, but I'm, I'm going to produce a prop here. This is a bottle of wine produced in Australia. You may have seen, some of you may even have consumed wine produced in Australia. Now, the UK is the biggest market for wine produced in Australia. Australia sells us. <laughs> Australia sells, sells us more wine than, than they do to any other country. Wine that is produced in Australia competes on price, on price, with wines produced in Spain, France, Italy, even Bulgaria. But Australia does not have a trade agreement with the European Union. Far less is there unconditional free movement or any right to settle for Australians in the European Union. Nonetheless, Australia has access to the European Union markets, including the United Kingdom, without a trade agreement and without freedom of movement. The point I'm making is that we in the UK would have similar access to the European Union without a trade agreement, but trading under world trade, trade, trade organization rules. As Australia does, as China does, as the United States does today. On trade, after Brexit, to paraphrase, Franklin Delano Roosevelt at his inauguration speech in 1933, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. <laughs> we have to be prepared and able to walk away. Yeah. Now, on immigration, to quote Nigel Farage. Actually, I don't think it's very often that Nigel's been uh, quoted after, after F.D. Roosevelt, but never mind. He said, we just want to be a normal country that can control its own borders. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Despite all the abuse, that's what it is. Now, let's be clear to the Scottish National Party, who want unlimited immigration, that the people immigrating into this country don't want to live on Culloden Moor. <laughs> and also, to the, Liberal Democrat, to the Liberal Democrats, 
who also want unrestricted immigration, they don't want to live on Exmoor either. <laughs> and surprisingly for me, they don't even want to live on Dartmoor. <laughs> That's why there's a housing crisis in this country, and an important factor in that crisis is immigration, and that is never mentioned by the commentary. Now, back to Brexit. To the die-hard Remainers, I would say this. Look at the facts, not the false facts and the fake news from the BBC. The real facts. Economic forecast after economic forecast has shown that Brexit will be good for Britain. And as well as the unanswerable constitutional case for leaving, we want to rule ourselves, there is a clear economic case as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what UKIP stands for. We don't just stand for real Brexit. We also, we have a dream. A dream of an independent country that is not a province in a protectionist European superstate. Yeah. That is international and outward looking. That controls its own borders. That has an ethical policy on immigration that is self-confident, and above all, believes in itself. We believe in Britain. So in conclusion, to go back to what I said earlier, divorce. Yes, a divorce can be expensive, but much, much more important, freedom is priceless. Thank you very much.